My name is John Bucknell. I'm a professional engineer. I've spent about 25 years in the automotive and aerospace industries, but those aren't my passions. Most of my publications are on the subject of uh, nuclear rockets. I'm one of the few people actually working on the subject matter, but obviously I'm here today to talk about uh, nuclear power. Energy conversion is something that I've spent my entire career on. How to improve the economics of your nuclear power plant. I'm going to talk about the world's energy consumption, how that impacts us and our planning, uh, talk about the impacts of renewables, talk about levelized energy cost, which is how much it takes uh, the producer of the nuclear power plant to actually sell the electricity or other energy products without losing money. And then a uh, proposal on how to leverage uh, these forthcoming high temperature nuclear reactors to produce energy storage. So obviously we're all here because we think that thorium in particular and nuclear in general is a safe, low cost energy source and it's vital to the future of humanity if we're going to uh, bring all of us up to the same level of expenditure on energy that we have in North America. Also, we want to have that energy distributable uh, so that no one person controls it, no one organization controls it, so that we can have ongoing prosperity for all. Nuclear probably is the best bet for doing that. What we want to do is to make sure that econ the economics of the nuclear power address most beneficially for all. So the topic is to change the paradigm a little bit about how to build your nuclear power plants. If you build a nuclear power plant capable of producing many product streams, you probably want to build them at maximal capacity. So you don't want to build them just for base load. You want to build them as big as you can uh, and use that excess energy to create uh, chemical energy storage. So this chart is probably the most informative. Right now, primary energy consumption is mostly fossil fuel, about 85% as of last year. Nuclear accounts for about 5% of that total worldwide. And if you look at how those are consumed in the final form, electricity is only about 20% of the total. The balance is used directly for heat or motivation or, or some other factor. Electricity is just a small part of the picture. In fact, there are areas that struggle a lot uh, with electricity. Transport in particular is a, about a third compared to the other uh, sectors that are consumers. If you look at the chart on the right, of this third of total energy used, there are some areas that are primarily the heavy-duty consumers uh, that can't be electrified. We've talked about hydrogen as an energy source for those consumers, but designing aircraft even around a liquid hydrogen is a challenge. Really, we have no technical solution for anything else other than hydrocarbons right now. That's also true for heavy-duty marine and even over-the-road trucks. There is really no uh, solution set that uh, gets you to electrification. We need to continue to have chemical uh, energy storage these uh, consumers for a long period to come. There's seasonal and daily variation in energy consumption on the electrical side. If you build a baseload plant, you can operate that plant all the time. 90% capacity factors are not unusual for nuclear power plants. However, uh, there's a 30% variation you know, hour to hour, even during the summer, which is generally the highest consumer. And if you build a peaking power plant to cover that, it's only going to operate about half the time, a little bit more. And if you build a power plant in smaller markets that needs to cover the entire energy demand during the day, it's only going to be able to run about 80% of the time because it has to load follow. And in the presence of solar, it gets worse. Uh, if you assume that 10% of your uh, energy demand is covered by solar power, you start worrying about the energy storage problem. In this case, you can see that the, the numbers change a lot. Your peaking plant can only run about a third of the time. Even if you have base load capacity, it's only going to run about 60% of the time. Projections that solar power is going to cover more than 10% of the total energy demand are quite a bit higher than that. Some planners would like to go to 50%. So that makes this problem even worse. There's some uh, publications out there on, on nuclear power on how much it costs to generate. But most of them talk about 90% capacity factors or better. Thankfully, the Energy Information Administration publishes estimates on Gen 3 nuclear power, and this is AP1000 on the left. It makes about 10 to 11 cents per kilowatt hour at 90% capacity. But if you run it lower than that, it can triple uh, the cost of energy, all the way down to 30% capacity factors. Thorcon has the most detailed uh, executive summary on finances ever published, um, and uh, I thank them for that so I can do this analysis. Their projections, of course, are to get the cost of electricity down about $0.05 cents per kilowatt hour, which is great. But even still, if you run at lower capacity factors, those numbers uh, can almost double. 
the biggest takeaway is that these costs are driven by the amortization, the finance costs of the building of the plant themselves. And I'm using pretty conservative numbers for these uh, projections. So they assume a 20-year finance period with a 10% interest rate. Now those are both uh, maybe on the on the the high end of what, what you might expect for a utility scale of production, but we're just using this for a frame of reference. Most of you might have heard of the sulfur iodine energy conversion cycle, which extracts hydrogen from water. You need a high temperature energy source to do so. Particularly, you need about 900 C. In fact, when nuclear was in its heyday, NASA published uh, this solution set in 1976. And the reason for that is that you can use your energy source through CO2 recycling to make chemical energy, and that CO2 that you produce, even when you burn chemical energy storage at the end, recycles itself right back in the atmosphere. This arrow on the lower left, if you can see my cursor, the atmosphere and the ocean are both in equilibrium with each other. So you increase the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, it goes right into the seawater. In particular, we're going to talk about thermochemical cycles, because that's the one that's most favorable with high temperature nuclear reactors. So talking about capacity for turning nuclear energy into historical chemical fuels, General Atomics has done a lot of work on the analysis of this chemical process. It's quite complex. The yield of hydrogen is a function of the energy input and as a function of the process temperature. And this is the energy that's coming from the reactor itself. Uh, they did a study uh, assuming they could get about 827C as their, um, as their source temperature. However, most molten salt reactors are planning about a 700C peak. And that's for a variety of reasons. Some of them have to do with the negative temperature coefficient and the safety aspect of the reactors. At that temperature, the sulfur iodine cycle only yields about 10% of, uh, of its energy in hydrogen. The good news is there's a solution, in, and this actually comes from the nuclear rocket world. This is called a turbo inductor. It's a form of heat pump. It's a turbo machine that takes a portion of the of this product stream, which you can see in pink here, and spins a turbine with a... Uh, magnets on the end, and those magnets are spinning past a, a tungsten fin, and they are able to inductively heat uh, that tungsten. So the product flying on the periphery, which is in green, is heated up quite a bit. In the nuclear rockets, they're trying to get above 3600 degrees C, which helps your uh, efficiency of your rocket. But in this case, for energy conversion, you can push your molten salt reactor temperature up to 1000 C. This chart is actually a process yield assuming a turbo inductor as your heat pump. And you can go from that 10% conversion efficiency to about 51% if you can get 1,000 C process temp peaks. So my proposal is a cogeneration plant. It's a combination of a 50% efficient MSR plant using a combination of Brayton and Rankin cycles to get that uh, efficiency up. And then that uh, chart from the prior slide is a 50% efficient sulfur iodine conversion plant. So you can see those numbers are strangely well matched. You can get the same amount of electricity or hydrogen for the same amount of energy input. And then at the end, I've tacked on a methanol synthesis plant, which is able to take uh, that product stream and turn it into an easily storable and transportable form of energy. So to zoom in, any of the high temperature molten salt reactors will work fine. I've drawn fly-based solution running about 700 C and using a, a Brayton cycle to convert that from a primary source. The only reasons I choose Brayton over supercritical CO2 is the overall pressures are about half. And in this case, you run about three identical turbo generators. I'm a turbo machine guy. This doesn't scare me at all. Some people are scared of turbo machines. This is really quite straightforward. But the big thing is if you have uh, online chemical recycling, your plant can probably run all the time, 100% uptime. And if you need to service these turbo generators, you can shut down one or two at a time and continue to function as a chemical energy storage plant. So this is an attempt to get uptime as high as possible. Also, uh, the, the Rankin cycle is run in a refrigerant to recover the low-grade waste heat, and you'll see why that's important here in a moment. In this chart, the heat leaves to the top, and I'll show you where it goes in the next. This is the sulfur iodine plant. Quite a complex process. I'm not going to describe it right now, but you can see in the center left, the turbo inductor, which is able to actively divert the heat from the, the high temperature loop that would normally be generating electricity into the generation plant, which is generating hydrogen. And you can see the heat coming in from the bottom, going through the turbo inductor, and then through the sulfur iodine plant. Distilled water comes in from the top and then hydrogen, and as it happens, oxygen leaves uh, going outwards. Lastly is the methanol synthesis plant. Um, again, methanol is my preferred energy storage solution, but there's lots of choices. Methanol is a feedstock for many petrochemical processes, so you can go from methanol to many other products uh, such as plastics. Uh, in this case, I'm uh, showing a CO2 extraction from seawater. Any source of fresh water will do, but uh, seawater is uh, particularly important if you also 
want to uh, do desalination. As it happens, this particular solution set uses the waste heat from the plant and is cooled by the seawater, and you get desalinated water for free on top of it. So the economics of this plant get even better. This implies well, using the Thorcon economics published in their 2015 executive summary, also assuming a 20-year finance period with 10% cost of capital. Three cents per kilowatt hour of electricity is, is a primary product stream, and using about a 44% uh, conversion efficiency as opposed to the 50% I showed you earlier. The interesting bit is that capacity factors on the left, as you go down, they're using less and less for electricity, more and more chemical energy storage. Compared to even our $40 per barrel oil prices, you can make methanol basically at parity. You can get back to parity, which is in the lower right, with current gasoline prices. Even running your plant for fuel production. Make chemical energy storage for the same price as our very low petroleum costs. Also to note, hydrogen is not cheap. There are plans to roll out fuel cell powered cars here shortly. If you have one or have had the opportunity to use one, you're charged about $16 to $18 a kilogram uh, for hydrogen. Those are what the prices for transport use is going forward. That's $419 per megawatt hour, so quite a bit more than what we're paying for electricity. This system is able to produce hydrogen at a tiny fraction of that. It's still about double the very low cost of uh, natural gas we have today, but potentially uh, it's a direct replacement for a lot of natural gas consumers. This is the same thing that we've all been saying. A nuclear cannon should be a part of our prosperous future. We want the lowest energy cost possible for all applications, for universal prosperity. To supplant the majority of end-use energy consumption, nuclear must be capable of economic production of product streams that drop in to many energy pathways today. This proposed flexible cogeneration plant will be able to produce product streams at or below current energy costs, with four out of five installations likely strictly replacing fossil fuels. And I didn't show this in the chart earlier, but the costs drop radically as the plants are fully capitalized. The lower note here in the lower right, the first line, electricity at $14 per megawatt hour once you're fully paid off, hydrogen at $6 per megawatt hour, and methanol at $12 per megawatt hour. These are fractions of what we're paying today. It only takes 20 years to pay off these very conservative assessments of what the costs are. And I would even say the, the hydrogen plant and the methanol plant are probably more expensive than they would be for real once we learn how to do them. So that concludes my talk. Thank you for listening. I, th I think I went super fast because I know we're all in a hurry to go see this eclipse. Do we have time for questions? If uh, we can get a gigawatt of electricity for $2 billion capital cost, does the rest of your plant cost more or less, and do you then optimize nuclear or generation? How much uh, capital above and beyond what you need for the nuclear plant or power plant do you need for the hydrogen and the methanol plant? And then what are the costs going forward from that? Did I characterize it properly. Okay, so all these analysis is assume plant for the methanol and the, hyd and the hydrogen are on, above and beyond the nuclear plant. Cost of the, the methanol plant and the cost of the hydrogen plant are only about a, a quarter of the cost of the, the nuclear plant itself. Um, and again, the product streams are, as I, I showed on, this, um, on the slides, but uh, about the same amount of energy coming out as hydrogen as you would in electricity. Obviously, this is a, a rough draft. There will be a journal paper here toward the end of the year if all goes well. Do you have a rough estimation of how long it would take to build all of these facilities? Do you plan to build like one first or kind of build them all at the same time? Uh, based on this analysis, I would argue you probably want to build them all at once. Uh, your consumers are already there. Um, if any of you drive flex fuel cars that run on E85, all that work to make them um, ethanol compatible is actually all the work that was done to make them methanol compatible in the early 90s. Wouldn't be hard to go uh, back to methanol, although it, you can convert uh, methanol to gasoline, not too hard. It's all dependent on, on uh, how easily the, the, the high temperature energy source uh, becomes available. So I would argue that, yes, if you want to displace all the fossil fuels, you probably want to go directly to the, the system that can replace it. They exist. These technologies are not new, with the exception of the, the molten salt reactors, which are not very new. As soon as those high temperature reactors are available, you can start doing it. I think we need to thank John for his analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll shake your hand, man. All right. Thanks, brother.